This is MSU Today. Here's Russ White. Well, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, MSU Assistant Professor of Political Science and Core Faculty in the African Studies Center, Michael Vaughman, to MSU Today. Michael, great to see you. Thank you so much, Russell, and thank you for inviting me. This is exciting. We're going to hear your conversation with uh, former Malawi President Dr. Joyce Banda here in a minute. But before we get to that, let's set the scene a little bit. In general, describe what your research interests are. Yeah, so my research is focusing on African democracy more broadly, uh, and I'm uh, particularly interested in issues related to elections and how you arrange free, fair and credible elections on the African continent. Uh, I've studied Malawi for many years, and uh, actually I've I've observed several Malawian elections, including the one uh, where uh, Joyce Banda stood for re-election in uh, 2014. So now talk about this particular research project that is going to lead into this conversation with Dr. Banda. Yeah, so um, I've had a conversation with uh, Dr. Banda for a few weeks now. Um, We here at MSU, uh, we started a new research project that has to do with uh, female parliamentary behavior. So what we know around the world is that it's not only the case that women are represented in parliament to a lesser extent than men, but when they come into parliament, they also seem to be sidelined. And there are many ways in which we could measure this. Uh, One of the clearest metrics in in which we can see this is the extent to which they they participate in debates. And there are many obstacles uh, to doing so. And this is true across the world. It's also true in Malawi. Um, So we started a new research project where we wanted to see how does a female president inspire other elite uh, women, for instance, members of parliament. And can we see that when a woman becomes president, we see uh, changes in parliamentary behavior among, um, among female MPs. And this is indeed what we saw. So we coded hundreds of thousands of speeches in the Malawi parliament using machine learning and we looked particularly in at the period uh, uh, 2009 to 2014 in Malawi. In the two first uh, two and a half first years of that period, we had a f- uh, male um, uh, uh, president who died in office, and then Banda became the president in the last two and a half years. And what we saw was that there was a significant increase in the number of speeches. Uh, held by female MPs. And also we saw a change in the sort of things that they talked about. So they talked more on the sort of issues that has normally been associated with kind of male spheres, particularly the the, uh, the economy. So this really, uh, we argue, shows the symbolic power of a female president such as Joyce Banda. So Michael, tell us a little bit more about President Dr. Joyce Banda and then how you got connected with her for this conversation we're about to hear. So um, Dr. Banda uh, is one of the seminal leaders on the African continent. Uh, She was the president of Malawi between 2012 and 2014. And she was the second ever female president on the African continent. Uh, The first one was uh, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson in Liberia. Uh, Prior to becoming the president, uh, she had been the vice president, the minister of foreign affairs, and the Minister of uh, Women, uh, Child uh, Welfare and Community Services. And she had also been a a member of parliament. The thing that is important to know about President Banda is that she came into power under very peculiar circumstances. She was never elected to become the president. She became the president because the former president died in office. Uh, And she took uh, over power in in a very difficult point in time for Malawi. Malawi was in a deep economic recession. There have been some serious uh, human rights abuses in the period before her. Uh, But she came in and and, and was a formidable force in Malawi as the president for two years. She was ranked as one of the most powerful women in the world by Forbes Forbes magazine in 2012, 13 and 14. Uh, And beyond that, she's also distinguished herself as uh, a leading activist and uh, philanthropist. She's the founder of the Joyce Banda Foundation, and she's been working very hard on issues that has to do with women's physical and economic rights and continues to do so. Uh, my own involvement with Dr. Banda came in relation to this uh, article that was published in the, um, in, uh, 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 the American uh, Political Science Review, 
Uh, and she was fascinated by these results and uh, was interested in this conversation. So, so that's the background to this, this interview. Well, Michael, thank you so much. And uh, again, this is MSU Today in cooperation with Democracy in Africa. Here's MSU Professor Michael Vauman and former president of Malawi, Dr. Joyce Banda. Your Excellency, Dr. Joyce Banda, it's such a tremendous honor to have you uh, with us today. Um, I followed your extraordinary career for many years, and I remain fascinated with the legacy that you have in Malawi and uh, in politics across the African continent. Uh, we were hoping that this conversation would revolve particularly around the theme of female political role models. And obviously, there are few people in the world uh, who are better equipped to talk on this issue. Um, you came into public office in a time where there were relatively few women in public service in Malawi and across the world. And you rose to become the second ever uh, female president on the African continent. So your excellency, yeah. at this point, being out of elected office, to what extent do you think that you still have an important role to fill in being a role model for younger women entering into public service in Malawi and elsewhere? Yeah, I think for you better understand that I didn't set out to be a leader, a political leader. I knew very young, well, uh, around eight years old, an uncle of mine was talking to my, to my father that I see something special in this child, and this child shall be great. And at a time when nobody would even imagine that Malawi would ever have a female president, this is 1958. So they planted a seed. And whatever I was going to do that was special, I didn't know, but it, it, ever so often my father would remind me about um, the, the, what my uncle had said. That is number one. Number two, <laughs> all the issues I have championed in my life originated from personal experience. When I was uh, 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 growing up in my village, against all odds, my father fought with my grandmother to take me out of that village to to go and live in town where he lived in order to send me to school against tradition where my grandmother was supposed to bring me up. I left behind a good friend of mine by the name of Chrissy. Chrissy was brighter than me. She went to the village school. We went all the way to end of primary school. We were both selected to the best girls secondary schools in Malawi. She went one term and could go back because the family could not raise the $6 that she, uh, she, she, she needed to go back to school. So at age 14, I realized that this world is unfair. And I saw, I, I made up my mind at that age that I would grow up and send as many girls as possible to school. In 1984, I went to give birth to my first born child and suffered what they call postpartum hemorrhage and was bleeding to death. It is the highest cause of death for pregnant women in Malawi and Africa. At that time, 1,200 women were dying giving birth. And when I was saved but one of, by one of only three doctors in, in my country, at that time, I made up my mind that I would fight maternal mortality because it's not fair. It's not right. It is not right because in, in America, if somebody is pregnant, it's a time of expectation and joy. And they prepare for nothing else but a baby. In Africa, we don't know when, whether we go, we will come back. It is that injustice that a woman should die giving life when it can be avoided. That became one of my fights. For as long as I live, I shall refuse to accept that a woman will die giving life. I spent my 1971 to 1981 in an abusive marriage. By age 26, I had three children and I tolerated all that abuse. In 1981, I packed my bags and left and made up my mind that for as long as I live, I shall fight the injustice, the gender-based violence. And I discovered very quickly that the, uh, economic empowerment is key for social and political empowerment. So I, I drew my first um, mission statement in 1981 when I left that marriage, that I'll spend my life assisting women, youth and girls, uh, gain social and political empowerment through business and education. So my, my ascending to leadership, it is that work uh, that propelled me into leadership. It is the women that I worked with at grassroots. 
for me, it has been about supporting vulnerable people, disadvantaged men and women and girls who live a better life at grassroots. And it is those that pushed me to go into elected office. Mm. But now I learned very quickly two things. That number one, leadership is a love affair. You must fall in love with the people you serve and the people must fall in love with you. And so I made up my mind that I was going to listen to what the people say, that I love and that love me back. When you love those people that you serve, you will not want anybody to exploit them or to mistreat them or to abuse them. You will fight for justice for, on their behalf forever. So when they said go to parliament and ch change those laws that negatively impact on us, I saw that as a great opportunity. So in 2004, late, I was 54. I stood for election to go to parliament. And I got to parliament and was fortunate to be appointed minister of women and girls, uh, uh, women and children. And so straight away, dusted up a bill that had been a draft bill that had been sitting on the shelf for seven years and championed the passing of the domestic violence bill. That's the first time Malawians, although I had done a lot of work in the civil society, economically empowering women, but this was the law that changed the perception of Malawians on Joyce Band. To them, then they saw a leader, whether she was female or male, and this was going to help later on as I ascended into office. So when Dr. people Bana, then became I, blind to my gender. So Dr. Banda, I, I would like to, 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 um, to ask you a little bit more about this because I think your story is one uh, that is very relatable to, to many uh, Malawian women and women around the world. You, you faced a lot of the same obstacles as many of your voters, whether that be gender-based violence, access to education, access to quality healthcare. But of course, going from that activist role, entering into politics can often be a challenge. And when you were elected to parliament, there weren't many women in, in, uh, in the Malawi parliament. Um, how was your first interaction with national level po uh, politics? And, and did you feel uh, that at the, the institutions were ready uh, to take you on in that, in that position? Yeah, I, I think what happened is uh, initially working at grassroots, I started an organization called the National Association of Business Women in 1989. And I shall forever be grateful to the American government that supported me and provided resources for me to do that work. So from between 1989 to 1997, we had reached 50,000 women and provided microfinance and training. And economic empowerment is power when, for rural women. So by the time I went into politics, I had a, a critical mass of people that supported me, that trusted me, because you have to earn people's respect and trust particularly at grassroots level. And in my case, they knew that I was a volunteer. I wasn't doing anything to be paid. So it is that that, that helped me. So I, it is difficult for me to, to say what other people went through. It is for me to look at how this critical mass of supporters, this network of women across the country, that is what shielded me. And even families, in the beginning, men were resentful because when women became powerful because through economic empowerment, the first person they talked about was Joyce Banda. It is because of Joyce Banda you are this. But then so we incorporated in our training uh, steps that women must take, make sure that they don't intimidate their husbands in a patriarchal society such as ours. So it, 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 I, I, I'm, I can say that what the world doesn't know is that African women were leaders of their nations before colonization. Mm. In fact, it is colonization that delayed them. And the, some people have written to say it is because those that colonized us, some of them did not have in their systems in the integration of women in leadership. So mm. they didn't know what to do with the women. But what happened in the 50s, as our brothers rose to fight for self rule women stood to the occasion, the Winnie Mandela's, Rose Chiwambo, women that you hear in Africa that rose and joined their brothers across the continent to fight. Mm. So one thing that I think the world doesn't know 
is that Africa is one place where psychologically men have seen women lead. And although there is patriarchy, that is one area where, we, that is why right now we have female president number six mm. on the continent of Africa. I know some parts of the world, they're still struggling to get one. I was amazed the other day, one country got a, a, a vice president for the first time after 200 years of democracy and we're rejoicing. And I said, oh, we have a dozens of vice president on our continent. So that is one thing that I can say. The country with the highest number of women in the parliament is on the continent of Africa. And president after president are appointing 50% of their cabinet women. Hmm. And, and yeah. I, I, I think that this is a key point and something uh, that isn't stressed enough, right? And I, and I think that also yeah. that there are many similarities between uh, a country like Malawi and a country like America or European countries in some of the obstacles that women are facing in, in, uh, in um, government. One of the things, and I think it was interesting that you were talking about aggressiveness and, 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 and sort of gendered expectations. Something that we found in our own uh, research here at, at MSU was that when women enter into parliament in Malawi, we see that they tend to be uh, slightly sidelined within that institution. They tend to speak less in parliament. They, less, they tend to access parliamentary leadership to a lesser extent than their male co uh, colleagues. Why do you think this is? And obviously this is not unique to Malawi. This is what we've seen elsewhere too. Yeah, when I was president, we were, we, were, we were seven women. We had seven women in parliament and then we moved to 11. And through the support, the kind support of donors who provided financial resources to women, because economic empowerment is key to social and political empowerment, as I said earlier. So when women don't have resources, they can't, talk, they can't organize a workshop for chiefs or youth to tell them what they will do, what they stand for. They lose elections, not because they, they wouldn't make good leaders, but because they don't have the resources. So we engaged donors and the donors helped to provide resources to all female candidates. And we went from 11 to 27. And the, I think this was 20, 2004. Mm. And then 2009, we went from 27 to 45 women. And the, so, so that, that, that has been the trend. But it, it's, it's difficult for women to compete on equal ground. It is not because the people don't want to vote for them, but they don't get to hear them during the campaign because they cannot afford the resources to fight. And uh, so uh, the 50-50 campaign that you're, you're speaking about, of course, has been a prominent part of Malawian politics for several elections. And there's been a lot of discussion about uh, their, their effectiveness, but it's not only about getting women elected, right? It's, it's, it's also about at the point that they are elected, are they uh, empowered uh, within the parliamentary institution so that they can actually speak for women when they're in parliament? And something that we, we found in our research was that there was a great divide, uh, uh, gender divide in uh, speaking town time in the Malawian parliament. But actually when you became president, we saw a great increase in the number of speeches made by women MPs. Uh, do you I would uh, be pleased to hear that um, the, our, our, our speaker now is a woman. I, I know, I, I know this. Uh, so, so obviously uh, um, uh, Malawian women have made a big, uh, 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 ha have improved their position within parliament to a large extent. But do you think that um, you being the first female president in Malawi can have had an inspirational effect on other women uh, at that elite level. Yeah, but uh, what you see during research and the actual situation sometimes can be different. Um, Malawian women have not shied away because I, I want you to remember that the gender, uh, the domestic violence bill I'm talking about, when we passed it through parliament, it is at that time when we had only 27 women in parliament against 193. So there must be something we did right. Because that, was, that bill was emotive. I mean, we didn't even know it would ever pass. But we used strategies and we lobbied and we worked hard as only 27 women. So 27 women didn't shy away. 27 women took the, ho the, the horse by the, by the horn and made sure that we win, that we pass that bill in parliament, including engaging the public 
and awareness and 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 the, we we organized marches and we uh, uh, highlighted the, uh, violent acts of men upon women a man a, a man who chopped off both the arms of his wife a man who scooped out an eye of his wife a man who was aborting his women his wife so that they, they shouldn't have children using the crude 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 tools that uh, alerted the whole public and by the time we went into parliament to pass that law the whole public was on our side mm. uh, nevertheless there has been um uh, there, uh, at the time where you you became president and I, I would like to skip to to this episode which i i think is is an important one i mean you rose very much to the presidency under very peculiar circumstances um and mm. i don't think that this has been emphasized enough um you were um, uh, you were given a very hard ha hand uh, dealt to you when you became the president. Uh, Malawi was in economic uh, freefall. Uh, you had democratic erosion just a year before. You've had massive demonstrations with great government repression. Uh, you uh, uh, the government had fallen out with the donor community, uh, and you rose into power. Uh, without a majority in parliament uh, and uh, being the first female president. In that sort of uh, situation, uh, how do you shore up power and how do you make sure to get the, the political majorities that you need in order to have a progressive agenda? I think one or two or three things that have not featured in, in, in your findings is the fact that um, by the time I took office, the day I went into office, it was after 72 hours of struggling of, with the government to, officials and ministers to allow me to take off. There was that resistance from the ruling party because I had fallen out with my president. I was vice president constitutionally, but they had already started maneuvering to ensure that he, President Bingwam Tariga does not groom me to take over from him. At that point, I already had had a, an assassination attempt. So by the time the president passed on, I was uh, now prepared uh, I mean, to take over, but the, 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 they in government were not prepared to open space to allow me to take off. So for 72 hours, I was under siege, thanks to the uh, 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 general, the army general, who the, the armed forces in Malawi, they always stand with the people. If you if you researched about the election, the nullification and this, the election of last year, it is also the armed forces. The 1992 with Dr. Banda as the dictator for 30 years for things to begin to change, it was the armed forces that stood up and stood with the people. So equally in my three days, the armed forces, the army general stood up and the opened space for me to take off. So I took off. On a day, the very first day I became president, there was no fuel for a day in Malawi. There was no food for 2 million people in Malawi. There was no electricity in Malawi. The economy had only grown by 2%. In addition to all the issues you highlighted, that is the first day I take off. Even fuel to take me to my president's funeral was donated by the, country, the president of Zambia. Mm. Yeah, so it was, a, it, it was difficult. But one thing about female leaders, and I think you should watch the, the Tanzanian president that what she's doing. One, it, it, that is characteristic of female leaders. Female leaders get into leadership and they're decisive and they are brave and they take risks and they want to do just what is right, regardless of what, what risk it is or regardless of what the, the potential backlash that you might get. But as I said earlier, if you fell in love with the people you serve, you don't care. What you know is that you should do things right. So in 2012, shortly after your ascent to power, uh, one of the MPs in the Malawi parliament, uh, Jean Kaliani, uh, Kalilani, um, uh, said this in, 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 the, in, in parliament. He's, she said that the question is no longer whether a woman can be president of her country or not, uh, but rather what she can deliver. Malawi must get more and more women in decision-making positions. Um, 
what do you think that this particular moment and particularly given uh, the, the hard backlash and, and all the obstacles that you had to face coming into power, how do you think that this changed the perception of female leadership in Malawi? What you need to do is to come now and find out. Uh, I, I didn't know that I would live to see what I'm seeing now because um, people have come to ask, to understand what we were able to achieve in a, that short period when I finished the term of Dr. Dr. Bingo Abtarika. This country had no fuel when I came in. When I left, we had reserves for two weeks and even built reservoirs. When I came in, there was no electricity. By the time I left, we had added 64 megawatts to the grid. When I came in, there was no food for 2 million people. When I left, we had 1.9 million metric tons over production. When I came in, companies were operating at 35% because there was no foreign exchange to import raw materials. When I left, companies were operating at 85% and recruiting people. When I came in, the economy had grown by 2%. When I left, the economy had achieved 6.3%. When I came in, 675 people, women were dying, giving birth. When I left, we had reduced that by 32% and the African Union gave us an award for that mm. achievement. So it, it, it is all recorded, everybody can see, but when a woman is, is president, when a woman is a leader, she goes through so much abuse and propaganda. Unfortunately, women of not only Africa, but of the world, we don't have the capacity to protect ourselves or to lie or to, to fight. We are just concentrating on doing things right and doing the job. So mm. much so that at the end of the day, you can, the perception matters in politics. So people see what they read and they don't see you fight back and they can take that as truth. But it, for me, I married one of the finest lawyers in this country. My husband was chief justice of Malawi, the first Malawian attorney general as well. So he told me, as long as you don't do anything wrong, anybody can smear anything on you. At the end of the day, nobody shall ever touch you because it's about evidence. But if you feel deeply that you need to take action on corrupt leaders and officials, go ahead. So now it's 50 years. 56 years of our independence, no president has arrested 72 people at once except this mm. And that for me is my greatest achievement. The second achievement that we must take note is the fact that I'm one leader who appointed fellow women to positions of leadership. For the first time, head of civil service was a woman, Howard Lowe. Chief Justice of Malawi, Anastasia Sosa was a woman. Solicitor General, head of law society, a uh, law commission, head of human rights commission, deputy inspector general of police, two deputy governors of reserve bank, eight district commissioners, 100 appointments of women. These are things that never get recorded. So, uh, because this has also, um, both in, in, in the research on, on, on female leaders and, and also in some of the discussion about your, your, um, uh, your presidency, you're pointing to some key, uh, key, key appointments that you made of, of fellow women, but some have also questioned um, why there weren't more women in cabinet. So there were uh, six uh, female ministers in your cabinet out of uh, 22 uh, members, uh, which was not a, a dramatic increase after the reshuffle that you did in 2012. And what we've seen around the world is that actually women have not been particularly better than men in, uh, in appointing uh, female uh, cabinet ministers. Famously, for instance, Margaret Thatcher didn't have a single woman in her cabinet. Uh, is this how, many, how, many, how many women did President Trump have? And how uh, many women are in your own parliament? Yes, this, and that, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, I, I would agree with you on all these points, right? What do you need to understand is that that must not be an accusation towards women leaders at all. It must be that you people who are experts, who are, uh, must first understand the situation in which one finds himself or herself. In my case, as I've told you, it was a precarious period for me, uh, going into government when the, the people who should usher me into government are not willing to allow me to take off. 
Mm. So I'm getting into government because the whole country is on my side. In fact, the day I took off at six o'clock in the evening, the, the rural people had gathered at parliament and threatened that if Joyce Banda doesn't take oath today, we are burning down parliament. But it is now the, 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 here that this upper class that are struggling to accept that a woman can take oath. So when I got in, I decided that I was going to do things differently. For me, as you rightly pointed out, the situation that I found, our, our relations with the donors, our, 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 people were actually refusing to mourn the president because of what he had, the way he had treated them towards the end of his life. So my position was the announcement that I made. I said three things. I said, number one, we shall mourn our president like a king. Number two, we shall bring everybody together. There shall be no retribution we shall all hold hands and move forward as a nation. In order to demonstrate that, I had to pick people from other parties to form my cabinet. So my cabinet did not come from my party. So I had to bring MCP, I had to bring a Ford, I had to bring people's party, and I had to bring DPP, the same people that were saying I shouldn't get into government. Hmm. So that I am seen to be reconciling the nation. In that respect, in those other parties, they didn't have women. Mm. So in my party, I took six women. So that I, I had to do what I could do to move forward. So yes, you can want to have in, in Malawi. It's not like other parts of the uh, uh, other, other other democracies. I don't know what happens in America, but you find that in other cabinets, members of parliament are members of parliament. And when you come to choose your cabinet, you can choose professionals from outside, not here. In Malawi, you pick. Uh, the same members of parliament must form your cabinet. So within the same parliament, you pick your cabinet. So when I was picking this to form this integrated group, I had to pick from parliament. Mm. So if the party has no woman, but I must address the issues of reconciliation, I took men from there. Mm. So I had six women indeed. So but it, it is, and, and, and this I is compassion. I compensated that by making a lot of female appointments outside cabinet, because that was necessary for me. And, yeah, indeed, and it was easier for me to do. And indeed, this is something that uh, many people have spoken about in terms of the very delicate operation of creating coalitions, right, in, in, in African politics, which is key. You need to have uh, people in cabinet with the right sort of resources and the right sort of regional appeal, for instance, in order to build a broad coalition that can govern successfully and also win elections down the, right, uh, down the road, right? And this seems like this could be even one, uh, one further obstacle for women in, in, uh, in taking the next step, not only being in parliament, but taking the step to the, the, uh, to the front row and into cabinet. Yeah. Again, true. these resources matter, right? Yeah, that is true. You are right. So um, something um, that uh, some of, uh, some of uh, your critics have talked about in relation to the 2014 election, they've been uh, looking particularly at uh, female uh, MPs and their, their electoral success in the 2014 election. The 2014 election was the first election where actually women representation went down and every other election we've seen a positive trend in Malawi and some of your critics have suggested that this is connected to your presidency and a reflection on uh, on female leadership and, and, and you as, as a president. Do you find uh, any truth in this uh, this argument or, or do, you, do you look at it in a different way? Yeah, you have to make that judgment uh, because I, I told you the situation that I found Malawi in and what my success was. But I also want you to remember that when you go to for parliament elections, people come from different parties. So different parties will support their candidates. In our particular case, um, yes, the number went down. But the, 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 the thing to remember is the 2014 election can it not reflect a true election in Malawi. The rigging that took place in Malawi, the TPEX that was used to correct uh, tally sheets, the stealing of the election affected women more 
So most of the women you think lost their election did not lose their election. Mm. But then even my election, everybody knew that it was being stolen. And I made an announcement to the nation. Perhaps we should nullify the elections because the Malay Electoral Commission in Malay had announced that there had been fraud and that there was going to be a recount. But then they went and burned down the warehouse that was holding the ballot papers. So I made an announcement to the nation, let us have a rerun. And when we have a rerun, I will not stand so that I don't show as if I have personal vested interest. But let us give Malawians a chance to choose a leader of their choice. I did not even fight. I did not even have the means to go to court. And that is why I just considered and left. In 2014, the evidence of the rigging was identical. I mean, 2019, the evidence was identical. And that is why I and others got together to say, not again. This cannot be repeated because innocent women were losing their elections because they can't read. Men who are not even capable to become members of parliament were getting to be members of parliament. So we got together, nine parties, and went to court and challenged the election. And the, the elections were nullified. So what you should remember is the 2014 election cannot be an election that can be looked at and any judgment made against what happened that year, because most of the women did not lose the election, including myself. Yes, and um, uh, of course, I was myself on the ground in 2014. I studied the election very closely, and I, I will agree with you that there are many controversies about that election and uh, uh, that were not seriously dealt with because there wasn't, uh, there wasn't um, uh, a petition in the same way as in the 2019 election. But you know, women can't afford, I couldn't afford the kind of resources that you re require to challenge an election in court. Hmm. But then we, we saw that the same evidence when we went to court this time, and because it was men all together, I was the only woman out of the nine parties. They were able to put together resources and fight in court and win the case and get the, 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 the results nullified and have a rerun and win by 56%. And, and some would say, well, that's the appropriate way to do it, right? That, that there's no... Um... Uh, there is no constitutional mandate for a president to nullify an election. If an election should be nullified, that would have to be by the constitutional court, right? That is what I was asking. I was asking us to go to court mm. so that the results are nullified. And, mm. if, and I said, if we get that to happen, I shall not stand for election because I don't want to be seen to have, had, to have pushed for nullification because I've vested interest. But again, last year, 2020, that's exactly what, 2019, that's exactly what we did. The people, the best people with vested interest decided, let's get together, let's go to court, let's challenge the election, and the, the elections were nullified, the results. So, Your Excellency, I would like to talk a little bit about your, your legacy. So, you, you rightly pointed out that Malawi now has its first female speaker. We saw in uh, 2019 a higher share of female parliamentarians being elected than before. Uh, we've had subsequent uh, campaigns on trying to increase female political representation. Um, you talked earlier about many of the, uh, much of the misogyny, uh, much of the sexist attacks that you had to endure during your time in, uh, as president. Um, but do you believe that your period in office, although of course not every Malawian uh, will, uh, will agree with everything you did, you were at least a very strong leader and a leader that uh, had a great impact in those two years. Do you think that this period of time might have opened up uh, new uh, windows for other women to advance to the same level? When you come here, even if you, f if you ask a 10 year old, what do you want to become when you grow up? Who is your role model? Without fail, they will mention Joyce Band. I left office in 2014. And in 2018, there was a, a survey conducted here. I can send you a copy of that. And that, that research, that survey revealed that Joyce Band was the most, most trusted leader. So I'll send you that information because it was in the newspapers as well. So mm. there has been I think time tells when now they can see how I implemented big projects, but mostly also paid a lot of attention 
rural social programs that are, were pro poor. And secondly, the fact that I paid attention to ensure that women are participating in positions of leadership than ever before. And all those I mentioned earlier, in fact, in diplomatic service, it was 45%. So all those are not in office now. So we can't talk about that percentage anymore. Mm. So lastly, you mentioned yourself, the new Tanzanian president, uh, uh, President uh, Samia Sulu uh, Hassan. Uh, she became the first female president of Tanzania. And uh, it's striking how similar the circumstances are in relation to the way that you came to power. Um, have you had the opportunity to uh, talk to the Tanzanian president? And, and if so, what kind of advice did you give her? Um, I believe that it is unethical for you as a former leader to tell another leader how to do things or what to do. Even now in Malaya, as I've told you, that I'm on the advisory committee with the president. We, I'm very, very careful how I, uh, how I move in the, providing suggestions because I don't want my president to think that I'm, I'm invading his territory. Because you have been a president already, you have to move cautiously. So what we have done in, in, as, the, in as far as the, the Tanzanian president is concerned, we have in Africa what we call the African Women Leaders Network. And that network is an African Union network and UN women. I am on the steering committee. And so the five former, pre the five presidents in Africa, you know, we have had five, she's number six. So Ellen Sherif, Joyce Banda, Catherine Pans on Central Africa Republic, Amina Faki in the Mauritius, and the, now the president of Ethiopia. We are all members of the steering committee of the African Women Leaders Network. So what we have done, Ellen Sherif is our patron. We have written a joint letter to her, congratulating her, and we are looking forward to an opportunity when all of us can meet her together. But uh, no, I cannot indulge in telling her advice or telling her what to do. And to be honest with you, she is a fantastic woman. She is outstanding. She has surprised the world because she comes across as somebody who is very calm, but she is a very strong woman. So I don't think she needs anybody to advise her, but she needs a network of women to support her, to make her feel that she's not alone. And that we are planning to have a joint meet, a, a meeting of all the five of us and herself, just to greet her. That's fantastic. Uh, Madam President, uh, it's been an absolute honor to talk to you today. Uh, I think uh, we've all learned a lot from this, this discussion uh, about the importance of uh, female political role models. Uh, and also how hard some of the governing part can be and how the, yeah. uh, the, 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 the particular motive of trying to advance female uh, leadership uh, sometimes have other obstacles that you have to take into account as well to be an effective leader. So I uh, was thinking that um, it would be bad for me to leave this, this, this interview without making clear to my fellow women that it is not easy to become, a, to be a leader, a woman leader. I have had two assassination attempts. In one of them, my security man was hacked to death. But what I want all African women leader, women to know is that we can't stop. We must keep moving together. And those of us who are this age must provide support to the younger women. Because state house, we must match to, whether anybody likes it or not. And for that to happen, we cannot shy away, we cannot fear, we cannot get discouraged because George Banner was almost killed. No, or this other one in, in, in country X was stripped naked. No, or this other one in country X was beaten. No, because all those things are happening, but we have decided that we shall push all those aside, hold hands, form networks, support one another. This same African, African Women Leaders Network at African Union has two layers. One is my age, the next one is a younger age with their own strong committee, intergenerational, and we provide support to one another. We have agreed that we are morally obliged to provide support to the younger women. So we cannot shy away, we cannot fear, we cannot even fear a uh, smear campaign. Yes, abuse is there, the media, yes. Uh, 
tortures us, uh, uh, castigate us, do anything to make sure that we don't operate, smear campaigns that can send you to jail. But what I have gone through myself, my husband has told me, and I'm telling fellow women, as long as you are right and you are honest and you're serving your people with integrity and you're accountable and transparent, nothing will happen to you. So we must hold hands and move together into the future with hope. And we must get to the policy of formulating tables and our African brothers understand that women are the majority. And the last time I checked, we bring the other half into this world. So we cannot be ignored. They must open space at the table for us to sit at the policy of formulating tables and participating in leadership on the continent of Africa. Madam President, thank you so much. Zikomo Kwambili. Zikomo. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. All right, thank you. Russell, you got all of that, right? Wow, that was fantastic. What an honor to sit in on that. You're an inspiration. Thank you. That yes, was an honor. Uh, that was great. Yes, uh, Madam President, uh, it's, it's been a great honor. I, I, I really hope that this is not the, the last time we meet. I, I hope we can, we can uh, invite you to MSU at some point, or maybe I will get the chance to see you in, in Malawi at some point. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm.